morning and welcome to the Central Church of Christ. Let's stand as we just worship and praise our God of all wonders, the God of creation. And just uh, let's just sing this from our heart and just uh, celebrate Him this day. the world and saw the 
Father God, maybe in this day, will you just allow us to hear a whisper from you of how much you love us, how much you care for us, how much you are watching over us, even in spite of the things that we are dealing with and have dealt with in the past week. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity we have once again just to gather together to worship you and to praise you, to dive into your word and just... uh, Let it speak to our hearts and to make a difference. Father, you have a story you want to tell us, and that story is that you love us and you want a relationship with us. And Father, as we begin this series today, will you just uh, just guide us, help us to just fall in love with your word. It's a great day, Lord. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want you to listen to the way keep playing, guys. I want you to listen to the words of a song Robbie gave me this morning. All God's critters. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got. Listen to the bass. It's the one on the bottom where the bullfrog croaks. And the hippopotamus moans and groans with a big to-do and the old cow just goes, moo. The dog and the cat pick up the middle with the honeybee hums and the cricket fiddles. The donkey brays and the pony neighs and the old coyote just howls. Listen to the top where the little birds sing on melody with the high note ringing. The hoot out hollers over everything and the the jaybird disagrees. Singing in the nighttime, singing in the day. Little duck quacks, he's on his way. Possums ain't got much to say, and the porcupine just talks to himself. It's a simple song of living, living, sung everywhere. By the ox, the fox, the grizzly bear, grumpy alligator, and the hawks above. Sly raccoon and the turtle dove. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing high. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire, and some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got. All God's critters, all of God's creation, let's sing. All creatures of our God and King.
God's creatures got a place in the choir. You did a good job. We're gonna. Our next song is gonna be our communion song. And a little bit later in the song, it talks about I will stand. Would you stand at that moment um, as we just lift ourselves before our mighty God who came to this earth for a very specific purpose, and that was be that we might have that restored relationship with God.
Good morning. morning. In Sunday school class, I heard the word change quite a bit this morning. Some of us don't like change change at all. And uh, I don't know how many of you noticed that uh, we don't have a row of men sitting up here this morning. And we don't our communion trays. There's not enough to go around. Last week, Nancy and I, well, my bride of, I guess she's over here now. There's, there's change. My bride of 42 years, we went to Kansas City. And we went to a Christian church there, and we expected something different than what we, that goes on here. And, of course, our, we anticipated, and it was true, it was a lot a little different than what goes on here. Uh, most humans like think the change is scary. When you think about the Israelites, think you know when they left Egypt, things got rough. And what did they say to Moses? Let's get back to Egypt, where we know what's going to be going on. And then the prophets in the Old Testament were sent to change the minds of the Israelites. Some of them were successful. Some of them weren't. And the apostles, they didn't understand why Jesus had to leave them. Jesus told them in John chapter 16 that he had to leave so they could be filled with the Holy Spirit. There are so many things that change around us and, and all the time. Technology. Now, I've got a phone that is an antique to a lot of you. <laughs> but it, it, uh, it texts, texts me. It finds me when I'm out in no man's land. But, you know, it still beats that two longs and one short or one short and two longs if you remember those kinds that kind of dates us but there is one thing that we are sure that will never change and that is Jesus the fact that he died on the cross for our sins will always be true we can trust that he is in heaven preparing a place for us As Christians, we have been forgiven and adopted by God. This can only happen because of Jesus' sacrifice. That is why we gather around the Lord's table each week to remember Jesus' sacrifice. The way we would take of communion and how it is served may change, but the meaning of why we partake will never, never change change let's pray God our father it is a privilege to be here to be here with Christians and to sing those songs sing those praise songs that lift our hearts we stand tall for you we need you Jesus in our hearts we need you to walk with us each day to help us over the lows and be with us when we're on our highs. And as we partake, let us always be reminded of the sacrifice that was given. Because without your Son's grace, we would have nowhere to go. Bless this loaf and this cup, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
Dear Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for the chance to be in your house and worship you this morning. We thank you for all of creation that you authored and for putting us here on this earth, but not just putting us here to be alone, but that you had a plan from the very beginning for our salvation through your Son, Jesus. Now as we come to the time in our worship where we bring back our tithes and offerings, we just pray that you guide us in using them wisely to further your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Tony comes for the word this morning, we're going to have Willie and Haley come up. Kind of a celebration this morning, besides starting into the story, we're starting into the second year of having this fine young family with us. I don't know how you guys are with time, but sometimes time flies by so fast with me I don't realize it. It's almost the other way. These guys have fit so much into our congregation and have contributed so much that it seems to me like they've been around here for longer than a year because you you can't do that much for us in one year. Um, Besides being blessed with them here in our ministry, the elders were blessed Monday night by Haley coming and sharing with us a little bit. And it kind of tied into uh, a couple different things. And just to sum up, um, Haley basically shared with us that just by us attempting to be the body of Christ that we are called to be, she has undergone a lot of healing in this last year for some pretty deep hurts from some previous ministries and all. And that, as I say, touched a couple of notes. First of all, and Tony and Willie, I think, have both mentioned this. We've had some great things happening here in the, in the last year, couple of years, whatever. We look forward to some great things happening as we go into this series of the story. But Satan's never happy when great things are happening in God's church. And it's important for us at all times to be mindful of that, to be praying for our ministers and our leadership, and to be supporting them together as one unified body in any way that we can. So we're going to do that in just a little bit here when we get done with the other topic that it brought up. The other topic that it brought up, with Haley sharing that, with Moses sharing with us last week, with Teresa sharing with us a a couple, well, it's probably been more than a couple weeks ago, like I say, time flies on me. But anyway, kind of tied right into the idea of life groups starting tonight. And so many of us have a a human tendency to greet each other on Sunday morning and, how are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. And on we go. And we can be pretty superficial. And we've had it pointed out to us that we do live in a broken world. And a lot of times there are deep hurts that we don't know when we just superficially meet each other, even in the body of Christ on Sunday morning. And there's no more important way, no better way to get to the intimacy that we need to really edify each other as we're called to do than in that small group setting where we really can open ourselves up and share, hold each other accountable, and help us to become the people that God wants us to be. So it reminded us to to put forth that plea to everyone to be involved in a life group. You've got in your bulletin the ones that are already established and meeting. 
Tony and Monica and Sue and I are going to meet here at the church tonight. If there are some people that aren't already involved in one of the others, we want to help organize some more. We'll offer it up to be some other dates or times or whatever might work the best for, for people that aren't already involved in something else. And if you're not the person that has something deep inside that, you know, you need to get out and have somebody support you, maybe you're the person that God needs to support that other person that's going to be in that group. So we just really, really encourage everyone to think about life groups and be here and share with each other and help us become even more the body that God wants us to be. With that, I would like to just offer up a prayer for these fine folks and our leadership here, if you would pray with me. Lord, we just thank you for the Tryon family being added to your family here in Griswold, and for Tony and Monica before that. We just thank you for all that you've done to move in this church and in this community in the past year. And we look forward to what you're going to do as we start into the journey through your story and making it our own. We do just pray that you keep that wall of protection around our ministers, around all the leaders and the people of this church as we strive to do your will each and every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you're going to learn, hopefully by the time we're done with this school year, you're going to be able to learn the story of the Bible in 31 sections. Chapter one of our 31 chapters is creation. And, uh, and so we're going to just, we're going to walk through this. Hopefully by the time we're done, you're going to get cheat sheets to learn the story because these posters are going to just do the perimeter of this room by the time May rolls around. As you leave, you'll notice on the back beam back there, there will be a timeline of seeing how the timeline of the Bible goes. And so we're just going to have a lot of fun with this. Hopefully in Sunday school, you already got kind of a, a taste of the diving in and, th and things like that. A um, couple of things I want to mention before I get started this morning. Number one is this is a great resource, but it's not your Bible. Okay. Um, use your Bible, but I encourage you to read through this. Um, if you want to, I think it, it was mentioned in Aaron, Aaron's class this morning <clears throat> that, uh, that actually reading ahead in preparation for a week would be great. And so if you want to read chapter 2, Willie's preaching next week and uh, when God builds a nation. And so there's that. Also back here on the resource table is this uh, sheet that looks like this. This gives you what topic or what chapter we're going to be on on what Sunday. Okay, so if you miss a Sunday or you can't be here, you're traveling, got family stuff, whatever it might be, grab one of these. It's also in your newsletter. But put this somewhere where you can see and go, hey, I wasn't here for a week. Uh, what are we talking about this week? And you know what chapter to read and stuff like that. And so those are a couple of, a couple of things about the, the story. Um, that we're gonna <clears throat> that we're gonna cover. I apologize. My voice is like I I, I got this sinus gunk going on, and so <laughs> it's no fun. <clears throat> anyway, where does every good book begin? 
in the beginning. So if you got your Bible, turn to page one. Okay? Turn to page one. Most Bibles, that's the page it is. I mean, there's always a lot of pages before it. But uh, we're going to start in the very beginning of the Bible. And we're going to walk through actually just some thoughts from the first. I know most of the lessons were on chapter 8. But I'm going to dive into chapter 9 of Genesis. So if you got your Bible, I hope you'll just kind of follow along as we walk through this story. And uh, that God has a story for us. And uh, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, we see five words that are very powerful for us. I think five words that are very foundational for us in a Christian faith. In the beginning, God created. We start there because it tells us a lot of things. That there is beginning of time. God existed before the beginning of time, but there is a beginning of time. And then there is God. This infinite designer, this creator, this all-powerful, wonderful maker, God of wonders that we sang about this morning. God. And then He created. The amazing Hebrew word there. He took something, or He made something, out of nothing. I, I love the story. I believe the story of creation over the story of evolution. Because in evolution, my understanding basically is, is that all of us, if we believe in evolution, is that basically we're here by accident. You know, there's something just happened, there's a big bang and boom, you're here, there's not much explanation of it. It just happened. But I want to believe, and I believe, these five words. In the beginning, there was a God who created. He, took, he was the infinite designer. He is our creator. He, he crafted us. He molded us. And God made this beautiful creation. Genesis chapter 1 is the story of God's creation. You may notice in your bulletin a blank piece of paper. And you're probably wondering, why is there a blank piece of paper? Well, I want to teach you a little, a little activity that I taught to a bunch of 5th and 6th graders, no, 3rd and 4th graders last year at camp. It's a fun little way to know the six days of creation. So if you have a pen, hopefully you do, maybe there's, if, whatever. I want to show you this, this, this little illustration. That's why I have like, and it's got, you got to put your piece of paper portrait style, okay? Not landscape, portrait style. Okay, the six days of creation. In the be can you turn this, Russell, can you turn this down just a wee bit? It's like echoing somewhere up here. So, anyway, you need to draw two lines across your page. Okay, so you have three sections. This is going to be interesting in the bottom section. Maybe you won't be able to see it from the back, but you'll get the idea. Chapter 1 of Genesis tells us the story of God's creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you can see in the first day, it, each day says there was morning and there was evening, a blank day. So we're going to walk through those six days. On day one, so write a number one up here, because this is what happens on day one. In the beginning, God created the heavens. You have space. He created that. He created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light, and there was light and darkness. So what you do is you take your little earth thing here and you color in half of it, okay? Because there is light and there is darkness. There was morning and there was evening the first day. On the second day, God basically said, let's separate the waters from the waters. The, wa the expanse above to expanse, the expanse below. And so God created this, this difference. So we have waves. Just make waves across your middle section. And there was the atmosphere above. So there's a cloud in the sky. Okay? And then there's the waters below. And there was evening... And there was morning the second day. On the third day, God created... This is where you in the back may have a hard time, and i got to get down here. We'll see if I can get back up. On the third day, 
God created dry land. Out of, the surface was covered by water. And God made land. So we have this nice little rolling hills. Do not look like your waves. Dry land rose out of the water. And God made plants. So he made a tree. I did not pass art. Sorry, Aaron. Okay. And the plants, there's grass. There's bushes. Okay. So anyway. And there was evening. And there was morning. A third day. Now, if you have a pen in one color, switch with the neighbor so you have a pen in a different color. Okay? Because we're going to go on. On day four, over here, we have day four. On day four, we see that God created the heavens and the earth, but then He said, let there be lights to govern the day, the sky. And so God created the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. Oh, we need a little crater in here. So it doesn't quite look like a bowling ball. No, if I did two or three holes, then it'll look like a bowling ball. No, that's supposed to be the moon. Okay, but it also says He created the stars, you know, and all the, the galaxies and all of that stuff. And there was morning, and there was evening, a fourth day. On the fifth day, it says that God created what? The fish of the sea. Okay, here we go. There's your uh, fish. Okay? He created the fish of the sea. And I mean, it wasn't just fish. I mean, it's the things that swim in the sea. There might be a sea, sea turtle We'll make a little sea turtle here. I mean, I don't know. So anyway, like I say, sorry, Aaron, I didn't pass art. But anyway, he made the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. We got little birds flying around all over the sky. Maybe even flying reptiles. But anyway, on the fifth day, created the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. On day six... Oh, there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. On day six, back down on my knees and on this side because I'm left or right-handed, God created all the creatures that roamed the face of the earth. And so God created a cow or a horse or whatever, a puppy dog, smaller one that looks like it. I don't know. But on the sixth day was God's crowning creation. God created man. Okay? And there was morning and there was evening a sixth day. So God created in the beginning God. An infinite designer created this amazing world in which we live. I want you to open your Bible, if you will, and show this next verse, Robbie, if you will, as well. Towards the end of what it says in Genesis chapter 1. In verse 26, he says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. In the beginning, God created. And you and I are part of His greatest infinite design. Do not read quickly over the words that are said in that verse. Let us make man in our image. In the very beginning, we see this whole, the triune God being mentioned. There is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That there is this triune God, and God said, let us make man in our image. We are sent here to this earth to be the 
image bearers of God to be God's representatives upon the face of this earth. And so from the very first chapter of Genesis, all of a sudden we see that God has our story imprinted in His story. That we are very much an important part of His story. And we go on and we can read on in the chapters, though we see that something takes place in the world. And, and as we're going to kind of just fly through and we're going to see some things. That something takes place as, as sin entered the world. Sin comes along. And we see that Adam and Eve were given dominion over the earth. They were told to take care and cultivate the Garden of Eden. This beautiful place that God created for them to be in. And yet, we see in chapter 3, we jump to chapter... Chapter 2 is an amazing chapter because it just describes more in depth the story of the creation of humanity. Man and woman, male and female, He created them. And how in all of His creation there was one thing that was not good. It was not good for man to be alone. I don't think that means that He meant man to be married, but I think he, what He's saying is that man needs to be in relationship. He created us to be in relationship with Him, but He created us to be in relationship with one another. Very important verse in that, in that place. In chapter 3, though, we see that sin enters the world. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw the tree that was good for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. And she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The serpent. In the book of Revelation we see the serpent is called Satan or the devil. The serpent is more crafty than all. It's a great description of Satan. He is more crafty than all of us. He will scheme. He will, he will plant thoughts into our heads. He will try to destroy the work of God. And even in the very early beginning, we see that Satan enters into the scene and he begins to try to destroy the work of God. And he, he comes to Adam and Eve and he says, you know, did God really say? One of the things that Satan uses in his tactics is to get us to doubt to doubt God. When we begin to doubt God, then a lot of things begin to open up in our minds. Did God really say? And then he gets kind of twist. Did, no, he didn't really mean this. He meant that. And how many times do we do that with God's Word? Oh, it really doesn't mean this. Surely it meant that. You can see in the news that that happens in church. Well, God really didn't. Paul and Peter didn't really mean this. What they were really meaning was that. We begin to wrap around teachers who like to speak, teach what our itching ears want to hear. Satan is at work. And Satan was at work in the very, very beginning. But one of the greatest tactics that Satan will use is our own selfishness. We want what we want when we want it. We want what we want when we want it. And notice what he does with Satan, or with, with Adam and Eve. He's, he, dang, he, the fruit's there. Did God really say, God caused the doubt? And you know, he didn't really mean that. And notice what it says. She saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree... I can't read it clear back there. And the, the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit. My contention about what Satan deceived her into believing, he got her to believe, and Adam, to believe 
they didn't have what they already had. He got them to believe that they didn't have what they already had. They already had a knowledge of good and evil. You can do anything in the garden you want. You can eat of any tree in the garden you want. Except one. They knew good and they knew evil. If you eat it, you will surely die. But somehow Satan deceived. Satan just tricked her into thinking, you don't have what you really think you have and you want more than what you really truly have. And so Satan deceives Adam and Eve. Guys, I keep mentioning Adam because don't miss what it says. She ate and then she gave it to Adam who was where? Right there with her. I've heard guys preach, you know, we can blame the women for things. No. Guys, Adam screwed up. He did not protect his bride. He didn't protect his bride. And sin enters the world. An earthly dilemma enters into the scene of God's creation. And as we go on in the chapters, then you see that this earthly dilemma continues to rise to the surface in the chapters that go on. In chapter 4, we go on and we see that Adam and Eve, they were banished from the Garden of Eden because of sin. They were to work the soil with the sweat of their brow. Sue mentioned in our Sunday school class, there were weeds, you know, and uh, in the garden then. I mean, it's just like, they... They, were, they had to work harder than they had to work before and all that. There would be pain in childbearing. All these things happened. There was a consequence for the sin. But then they went on and they, they began to establish a family. In chapter 4, you see that Cain and Abel are born. And the human dilemma, the earthly dilemma, rises to the surface as it came time for a sacrifice and the two boys offered a sacrifice and God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. And Cain got jealous, and he kills his brother. Murder is introduced to the world. And you go on in the story, and you, you, you see that there's this curse that comes upon them. And on and on it goes. And in chapter 6, it finally gets to the point in chapter 6 that we see this description of the world at that time. Chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. It's a rather rapid transition that takes place from chapter 1 and 2 to chapter 6. Let us make man in our image, in the image of God. Let's, you know, we, he created him. And he saw all his creation. He said it was very good. But then in chapter 6, you see that God grieved that he made man. What takes place? What takes place is our sin. And the reality is sin always does something to our relationships our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. And so we see that God has we see, we see that God still has a plan. God still has a story that he wants to outline for us. And so as as uh, Dave Stone says in a sermon that I listened to this this week, Dave Stone says we have an earthly dilemma that begs for a heavenly solution. We have an earthly dilemma that begs for an earth, earthly solution. Our earthly dilemma is sin. But God, even in the very beginning chapters of the Bible, in the very beginning of the story, we see that God has a plan. And it goes with these words about who Noah is. In, in verse 9 of chapter 6, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. 
Wouldn't you love to have that as your description? Righteous, blameless in our generation, and that we walk with God. Even though the earthly dilemma rose to such a sur- surface, you know, that there was murder and there was, there, was, there was selfishness and there was greed and there's all these things that we see played out in the first five, six chapters that every inclination of the hearts were evil all the time. The depravity of us. Even with all of that, there was still righteousness. And Noah was a righteous man blameless in his generation and Noah walked with God we see next in the chapters is the story of the flood Noah builds an ark he and his sons and his wife and his son's wives earlier this year or maybe it was last year there was Hollywood's attempt at making the story of Noah and even though it was an interesting portrayal of it there's a couple of things I want to encourage you read your book Because in the story of Noah, there were eight in the ark, and there wasn't any stowaways. We see that Noah's sons were married. There were eight in all who were saved, as we will see in just a moment. So Noah and his sons and their wives build this ark, and God brings this miracle of all the animals of every kind coming to the ark, and He saves the world. He destroys the world, but yet He saves the world. Humanity. God's story is playing out. God's story is beginning to take place in the world. An earthly dilemma begs for a heavenly solution. And even in the story of the first eight, nine chapters of Genesis, we see that. We have an earthly dilemma. Sin enters the world, but and the inclinations of their thoughts were evil all the time. But God still had a plan. He was grieved that he made man, but he found Noah, and he found righteousness. What I want to point out is in these chapters, I think we see three very key elements of God's plan of an earthly solution. Three things that are required in order for us to have this solution, a solution to our earthly dilemma. The first element is this, it's sacrifice. As we go back to the, th- to the um, second chapter, we see that God has this plan to uh, make it right for man. And in the very beginning, when God banishes mankind from the Garden of Eden, He gives to us a promise. And where there's a promise, there is always hope. Notice what He says in, in uh, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Do I have that on there? Yeah, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Help me out, Robbie. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. You shall bruise his head, or he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Right here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is the very first messianic prophecy in the Bible even in the very beginning God says there will be a Messiah for you see on a Friday afternoon Satan thought he had struck the final blow to the heel of mankind when he struck Jesus to death I will strike his heel and Satan thought he had won the greatest victory there was he killed the Messiah But on Sunday morning, we know the story that he crushed the head of Satan when he came out of a tomb. The very first messianic prophecy is seen in this verse. I will put enmity between your offspring and hers. We will have this struggle between us and Satan in this world. We have this earthly dilemma, but God has a a heavenly solution. It will exist, but he will always have that. He has his heavenly solution in mind. And ultimately, it will involve the Messiah. But there are three elements that play out in the upper story. 
As we look at the lower story of sin in the world and every inclination of the heart is evil all the time, there is a heavenly story that is beginning to play out. And three things happen. The first one is sacrifice. You see, when when Adam and Eve sinned, all of a sudden it says their eyes were opened and they felt shame. And so they took fig leaves and they made garments for themselves. But don't miss what has happened later on in verse chapter 3, verse 21. In chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made a garment of skin for them. How did God make a garment of skin? It means something had to die. Something had to die. So the covenant of sacrifice is introduced to us in the Bible as well. When we sin, something has to die. When Adam and Eve sinned, something died so that they would get garments of skin. Their nakedness would be covered. Before that, they didn't have any worry about that. They were both naked and had no shame, but now they had shame. And so God said, okay, I'll make you a garment. Something died. And sacrifice is very much a part of God's plan of redemption, God's plan of salvation. Something must die. Paul wrote the words, these words, that the wages of sin is death. Something dies. The Hebrew writer says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The covenant of sacrifice was introduced in the very beginning. But there's a second element that we see. And I think it's seen in the words of how Noah is described. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in all his generation, and he walked with God. A second element in God's plan of salvation is that of righteousness. But Paul echoes a truth that we all know. Paul says, there is no one righteous. No, not even one in the book of Romans. None of us are righteous. So where do we find righteousness? If righteousness is a part of God's plan, where do we find righteousness? Turn, if you will, to the New Testament. To the book of 1 Peter. The New Testament to the book of 1 Peter. The first element is sacrifice. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for all the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Jesus had to die so that we could have forgiveness. Jesus was the righteous when we were the unrighteous. Sacrifice is required. Righteousness is required. None of us are righteous. No, not even one. But yet God has a plan. Jesus suffered in the flesh. And once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey, when God patiently waited, when? In the days of Noah. You see, God has this overarching story that goes on. We live the lower story. We see the sin. We we deal with the struggles. But even in all of this, God has this upper story. You're going to hear a lot about that thought. The upper story and the lower story. Even clear back in Noah's day, God has a plan. Even in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, here it is, eight persons, which were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to Him. The first requirement is that of sacrifice. Something has to die. Jesus died. Second requirement is righteousness. 
Noah was a righteous man, blameless before God. He walked with God. But as you read chapter 9 of Genesis, you see that even the most righteous of men will succumb to sin. You see the story after the flood, Noah plants a vineyard and he gets drunk and he gets, lays naked in his tent and his son succumbs to sin. And sin just seems to have a way to rise its ugly head over and over again. So it's like it's not in our own righteousness that we find salvation. It's in the righteousness of God and the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. The righteous dying for the unrighteous. Sacrifice, righteousness, and the third element is water. Is water. God saved eight and all in the flood. He used water to save, to destroy some, but to save others. He had a plan. And God's plan is still the same today. That through sacrifice, through righteousness, and through water, there is salvation. Now water in baptism is not the only thing. Hear me out on this. But I get frustrated and I get saddened by those who want to say baptism is not an essential part of God's plan. This water now symbolizes baptism that saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience. God has this plan. And the question is, is where will your story intersect God's story? We find that sin seems to always raise its ugly head in our life. But God promised to give us victory and salvation over sin through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and thus submitting to that righteousness and yielding our life to Him in baptism. The earthly dilemma begs for a heavenly solution. And God gives it to us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for just giving us this opportunity today to just start this story. As we begin to see the world as you created it to be, that even in that world, we gave in to our own inclinations of our own hearts. Father, help us to walk in righteousness before you not leaning on our own righteousness but on the righteousness of Jesus Christ Father will you just uh, move in our midst will you use us as a church to share this wonderful story to the community around us that others may know your story and how your story intersects our story Father I just pray that you will just Use this time as we sing this song of response and decision. The Father, if you are moving and you want us to make that commitment to you, to express our faith and trust in you, to yield our life to you, that today would be the day of salvation. That today is the day that we come to know you and the perfect relationship you want to have with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing this as a song of response.
We have an amazing God. He is a God of creation. He's a God of wonder. He is, and we need to worship and to praise Him. And and I hope that you will just get involved in whatever way you can. I know some, our, one of our, our we got life groups starting this today. And uh, if you're not a part of one, join us tonight, Rich and I tonight at six, and we'll we'll figure out a day we can do other than Sunday. But there's several starting today, and so. Uh, if you got questions, see Willie or I or, or Rich after worship today. Um, and uh, let's have a great week. Let's close with this song. The worship team sang it last week at the park. But uh, we are made to thrive is the name of the song. So it's like, let's sing this as we close. <laughs> We never will run dry.
out and read his word and reach out to the world. Have a great week.